From the Tiger Cats Audio Network, this is Tiger Cats Game Day with Courtney Steven and Mike Daly. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Tiger Cats Game Day on the Tiger Cats Audio Network. It is Sunday. It is game day in Toronto, and the Argos are the next opponent for the boys in black and gold. I'm here. I'm my name is Courtney Steven. I'm always joined by my co-host, my main man, my right hand, Mike Daly. And Mike, going into BMO is a special event. Doesn't matter if it's the first game of the season or the last game of the season, but it, it's come early in 2023 and the tie cats are hoping to uh you know put a little dampen on that parade of how the argos are going to open up their season their home opener today yeah and talk about busting out the uh the gray cup rings for when the tie cats come to town right they're going to have everybody all excited and the banners are going to be going up uh at bmo field so it's going to be you know a little bit of a uh, a stab in the heart for the Thai Cat fans that we know are going to make that travel down there because it's it's like practically a home game. You hear it constantly over and over and over again, but it's true. It's a a full section of Thai Cat fans that travel really well, so it'll be that little uh, sour taste in your mouth to start watching the the banner get raised in BMO Field, but all that kind of more motivation. And Court, did you feel like? Did you have any motivation from that kind of stuff, or is it just kind of like a new season, really, when you get in there? You know what? Like, football is a funny game because you can pull from so many different places to get motivated. You could pull from something that happened to you 10 years ago and really find a, a reason to get kind of mad about it. So if it's not the smelling salts and that little Gatorade cup pregame, you're going to look at the rings that are on the video board or the fans getting their freebies and you'll, you'll get spiced up somehow. But, uh, I don't think there'll be any shortage of motivation personally, myself. I, I never really got into that stuff too much. I was never one to be on the brink of coming to f- throwing hands and fighting and things <laughs> like that. I, I was there to do a job and I knew that if I stayed calm, cool, collected, you know, play with energy, but never lose sight of what the main thing is. Uh, That was just my approach to it. But I don't know, were you, were you at the 50 uh, on the, you know, they, they stop you from getting to center field. They tell you, wait at the 50 and uh, try and keep that little 10 yard buffer. Were you, were you toes on the 50 screaming at the other side or, or were you more sublime? No, I wasn't like that at all. It was one of those (laughs) things where I would imagine, you know, what's going through a lot of people's heads is, okay, let's just get this over with so we can kick the ball off. Because as soon as you line up for that kickoff, for that kickoff return, for that first play of the game, everything that happened before that, everything that happened at at that time, out the window. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Completely out the window. This is now next play, next down. And that's what we're going to get at BMO Field. It's going to be all that nice little jazz at the beginning. But once that ball is kicked off, it's a new season, a new rivalry between the Ticats and the Argos. And frankly, new teams for both of them, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and speaking about uh, going down there and having our own section, if you're going to the game today in Toronto, looking for a place to meet up with some other Thai Cats fans, make sure you head over to the Brazen Head Irish Pub, grab some pregame drinks, and meet up with your fellow fans. That's on uh, 165 East Liberty Street in Toronto. That will be the place for Thai Cats fans to meet up before the game today. So that's the Brazen Head if you're going downtown. If not, you know where to hang out. You're going to catch us on listen.tiecast.ca or on TSN because this is the regular season now. So let's talk about the actual game. Let's talk about the the players that are going to be on display and and let's talk about what this game means for the season. Right now the Tie Cats 0-1 after su- suffering a loss to the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and that game it was a high scoring affair. W- Winnipeg put up 42 points. The Tie Cats scored over 30. So it was a really high scoring game but the, the the game left a lot to be desired for the tie cats in one where I don't think that anyone outside of the tie cats organization was really counting on the tie cats to win that game, given that, you know, they're going up against what most would say is the most consistent, uh, most continuity 
on that team, 19 returning starters, Zach Caleros, you know, the, we can go down the whole list of things, but they they put on a show in Winnipeg and the Ticats, they starting out now 0-1, going up against the Argos, brand new face behind center, Chad Kelly, and they're 0-0 because they're coming off of a bye week. So what's the difference here, or what does this game really mean, uh, you know, comparing last week's season opener for the Ticats with this week's season opener for the Argos? You know what, it's, it's one of those things where it's almost – you know, yeah, that Winnipeg came out and they were on fire, right? And I think everybody kind of expected that, like you had just said, right? There's a lot of continuity there, and they came out. There there was a lot left to be desired with the Thai Cats, but what was nice to see was the fight that they came back with, right? Being down that much and watching all three phases actually pull it together a little bit and be able to help out and get that game close. I think what you'll see in this Argos game is, is that now it's like, okay, we have that one game under our belt and we're all not happy with how that went, right? So now it's this new refocus on this Argos team that's like, okay, we need to dial it in a little bit because we're not happy with how it went. So I'm, I'm kind of expecting to see this new energized Ticast team, especially a Bo Levi Mitchell who's been around the block a few times. He'll be able to look at all that and be like, okay, now it's time. I'm in here. Now the Ticats quarterback, all that flash is gone. I need to play better, right? And I think that's what everybody on that team is going to be saying. I need to play a little better, one little bit at a time. And then you get into this now playing the Argos, right? And, Corda, I want to get your take on this. But it's like this weird world of the Argos don't have any film because they didn't play anybody. They had that first <laughs> week by, right? But they have all the film of the Ticats playing Winnipeg. So there's this little you know, semblance of, okay, we know what the Ticats are going to do on offense and defense so we can game plan, but the Argos haven't had live bullets yet, right? So if you're in one camp or the other, which one would you rather be in? The Okay, we have some stuff that we can work with, or no, we have some live bullets, we're ready to roll, you know what I mean? Well, I would personally rather have played a full speed game and put, you know, 60 plays on offense, 60 plays on defense, on my players' mileage, you know, I want a locker room of guys that are battle tested because, in theory, you can do a whole lot of stuff. But as all the great coaches say, you know, you could draw up whatever. You still got to roll the ball out there and play the game. I think that's a coach oism. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I, I think there will be advantages for sure, and a lot of those things will be scripted into the first two drives of the game and you're going to see Toronto maybe when they come out on offense maybe they do move the ball and get two first downs because of something they've seen schematically but once you get into the rhythm it's very very easy to see if things have changed dramatically or if you're going to get what you expect to get from Ryan Dinwiddie the, the head coach who's an offensive mind for the Argos and I expect them to do a lot of what they've done in the past no one really recreates themselves in the off season, unless they bring in a completely new staff. So uh, while there would be a little bit of an advantage on paper, I think the practical advantage goes to the Thai cats because they actually have some scratches on their helmet from the first week. And, and I think there's a lot to build off of too, because um, some things that don't happen in practice, there's no referees in practice and the Thai cats, they had 17 penalties for 140 yards that's one thing right there where if you can clean that up, who knows how the game goes. Um, we had kicks out of bounds, two kicks out of bounds. We had some unnecessary roughness or some objectionable conduct type plays. And those things are really, um, you know, the kick out of bounds, I want to say it's it's also kind of mental. It's like an offside. It's where you kind of overthink it a little bit and you put it far too close into the corner when you really don't need to take that risk on a play such as the kickoff or, or the objectionable conducts and whatnot. So I think getting that out of your system can only be done in a game. And no matter how much you meet on it, some guys, especially younger guys like the Thai Cats have in some spots, they got to just work it out. They just got to sweat it out. So I'd rather be 0-1 than 0-0 with a bye week. Yeah, and I, I completely agree with you, right? And especially with when refer, uh, referencing those penalties, that is going to be, I mean, me and you have both been in that locker room. That is going to be topic one, two, three, four, five for the Thai Cats. Can't be taking these penalties, can't be hurting ourselves, can't be shooting ourselves in the foot, right? You hear that all the time. 
Now, talking about those young guys and building up, getting into this Argos game, right? You start to look at what happened last week and how can you build on that. Well, kind of where I'm looking for this game to build on that and kind of see a little bit better is I do want to find that defensive back group of the Ticats step up, right? We talk about Chad Kelly. We talk about all that kind of stuff. And, you know, he's played uh, four games. He's started one of them. And he just, when you play a quarterback that's new, switching up looks is going to help. But also just being in the right spot is going to help as well. Not giving them these easy passes that we saw in Winnipeg, a couple of those shots down the sideline, right, whatever it is. You just got to get in the right spot to start and make this guy beat you, right? So that's what I'm looking for a little bit in this game is I do want to see that Tiger Cat defensive back group kind of step up a little bit more because, you know, we talk about explosions. So those are those passes over 30 yards. It was just way too many in that first half of that Winnipeg game, right? So, and I know Mark Washington's going to work on that. I know everybody on that defense is going to work on it. But that's what I'm really looking forward to because, you know, everyone's going to say Chad Kelly's new, absolutely. But it starts with what's it within. And I think just getting into the right spot and limiting those explosions, no matter who's throwing the ball, that's going to be huge for this Ticats defense. Yeah, and, and for a new quarterback, a relatively uh, inexperienced quarterback in the league, Getting a big play can give you a lot of confidence, whereas having a turnover or something that goes catastrophically wrong can do a lot to ding your confidence. And I think the Ticats really have to capitalize on a couple of those missed opportunities for big plays. They did make a lot of big plays, or I should say they made a handful of big plays. Namely, uh, we had a fumble recovery taken back for a touchdown, which was amazing and then on special teams the the defense plays a lot of the special teams so i consider special teams on defense as well special <laughs> teams scored as well um and those kinds of things were done don't get me wrong but you know tunde adelike has an opportunity to get an interception in the end zone he doesn't squeeze it that ends up being points simone lawrence drops out of the sky in a, a disguised coverage goes to rob a uh you know intermediate route that one bounces off his hands. And those are two plays right there where I think they could turn the tide of a game where, you know, you needed something to get them going a little bit, especially in a, a higher scoring game like the one that they just had. So um, I expect this defense to bounce back and to put an emphasis on keeping the top on things. You know, for uh, Kenneth George Jr., it was his, his first start in the CFL. And it honestly, it looked like his first start in the CFL. And, you know, we've all been there where – you're just picking up the game speed. Things move a little bit quicker. Maybe the communication is a little bit um, not as sharp as it is in practice because it's louder and there's more things going on. So I think for him, he's able to shake those cobwebs off. And if not, you know, you got Will Sunderland right there too. He's up this week. And I think um, especially with Lawrence Woods being out and them bringing in two brand new DBs, you're going to see different combinations of guys and they're going to, have to figure out that chemistry they're going to have to figure out how to work together how to gel and that will be an integral part in the tie cats um going from 0 and one to one and one in this game if they're able to do so yeah and that's exactly right what it is right now especially early on in the season is they're all little stepping stones right it's working out those kinks but going to who is in and out right having lawrence woods out right that is It'll be interesting because we're going to see Gallimore get some more of the returns, and he obviously had a pretty good preseason, and they like what he does back there, or else they wouldn't put him in, right? But to have new corners again, right, and have that new field corner with uh, Lawson Jr. in there, that's going to be another kind of working through the kinks thing, right? He's a new player, same thing. I just think that'll be one of those tough ones where – He's going to have to get a little bit of game experience under his belt. But, like I said, the Chad Kelly experiment is a perfect experiment for this Ticats defense to go up against because, court. I don't know about you, but my personal opinion, it takes quarterbacks that come up into this league at least two years of playing to be able to wrap their head around the speed, the motion, how the defenses are playing. You can watch as much film as you want, but like you said, Till you get out there, live bullets, getting that experience under your belt. 
I think this is kind of a good game to work those kinks out. Now, can't sleep on them because they do have a lot of returning starters and guys that are going to be making plays for the Argos, so can't sleep on them, but good step, I think, with this new quarterback, Chad Kelly, for this defensive back group. Yeah, and transitioning from the defensive back group to another group who who begin every play moving backwards, that would be the offensive line. That little kick step move, it resembles <laughs> something of uh, press coverage, but just like an extra 150 pounds on each player. So you've got big uh, Joel Figueroa. He's starting at left tackle. And then on the opposite side, we've got Kemp in. He's been called up um, in for the injured Tyrone Riley. Now, I think this offensive line, they did a great job in opening up some rushing lanes early in the first game. Um James Butler was looking really good. He had one fumble, but he did finish the game with uh, 66 yards and a touchdown. So he was effective. And I thought that that was something we were really looking to see if they were going to be able to do. The run game for the Ticats, it was hot and cold in 2022. And even if they just have the consistency of somebody who's able to get four, five, six yards a carry, and, and James Butler got six yards a carry when he was given the rock 11 times, that's all you got to do in the CFL. Not to mention he did well in, in the past blocking for the most part. But I think towards the end of the game when they started to just pin their ears back and they knew it was desperation time, that's when most of the sacks came. So this offensive line, their ability to open up the run, keep this offense two-dimensional, pass and run and and give Bo time to settle in and really find those receivers I think they're going to be key 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 in this one especially when you're going up against big guys like Sean Oakman and and Flo Orumalade on the Argos defensive line Th those are those are great defensive linemen and you got to pay them their respect um, they're going to be in your in your face making it tough to make plays and then you got a guy like Winton McManus who is arguably one of the best linebackers in the CFL, um, there's going to be a challenge. You know, he's going to be blitzing and he's going to be, you know, trying to get in Bo's head. These guys are old teammates together in Calgary. But I think the offensive line, I will be focused very keenly on, on David Beard and the boys to see what they can do to give Bo some time and open up some lanes for James Butler. Yeah, and like we said, James Butler, I think, is going to be this wild card of this offense, right? He's going to be that one that opens it up and lets everything calm down for Bo, the offensive line. And he did look good. You saw flashes of him carrying bodies in Winnipeg, right? The fumbles, yeah, that's frustrating, but guess what? He's a veteran just like Bo Levi is, and that's why that one week to build off of that at Winnipeg and just clean it up and say, okay, i got to focus on this a little bit more. These are these little stepping stones that, you know, Watching the flashes of James Butler and watching the flashes of Bo Levi Mitchell, you know there's a couple throws that he had just missed him White on. That could have been big-time plays, right? But then moving over to somebody that did make a lot of plays, and that was Duke Williams, right? I thought Duke Williams had a great game. He, he was kind of all over the place. He had three targets, two receptions, but his yak yards were unbelievable. I think he had 18-yard average per catch last game in Winnipeg, and he's that big body. He's making a lot of plays, and you saw him making a few people miss after the catch. So having Duke kind of come out and get acquainted with this Ticats offense and get into that rhythm with Bo, um, that was nice to see because that is definitely going to be needed for this Argos defense. Yeah, I would love to see Duke Williams get a few more targets. He's somebody who's got, uh, you know, he creates mismatch problems for defensive backs He's just a bigger guy, and he's athletic, so that's tough. And another person, uh, Keandre Smith, we've talked about him before, but he had four receptions. He shows me a lot of Curly Gittins-esque potential. As a, a young Canadian receiver, Curly Gittins was the, the rage of the league last year as far as you know, young up-and-coming receivers go. Not to mention he's got the right passport for the Canadian Football League, and I think Keandre Smith brings a lot of that same type of energy to the Hamilton Tiger Cats offense, you know, four catches in the first game of the season, he was the most active guy, him and Tim White. And so I, I think continuing on that momentum and letting him, a guy who is a fiery competitor, getting him going early, that could be a spark for a lot of other guys in that offense. And, and the only difference between uh, Keandre and Curly is Keandre plays in the slot. He's he's in the mix. He's He's getting to it. So... I'm really excited to see how he can continue this and, and not just be 
you know, here for a little bit and then fall off. Like, I want to see him take this and, and grow that body of work that he started because he makes tough catches when he's getting hit. He's got great routes. Um, the hand seems secure. I just want to see him get in that end zone a little more often. And I'm sure he wants to see the same thing. Uh, I'm sure Bo would love to see the same thing. And, and we should talk about Bo for a second because there was so much we spoke about him coming into this game uh, his last week. He went 17 out of 33 for 197 yards, one touchdown, two interceptions. One of those was on a two-point conversion. So I don't know if you can even really count that, <laughs> but it's in the stats, so we'll, we'll go for it. How would you grade Bo's performance in the first game, and what are the changes or the adjustments that you want to see this week this week today here in Toronto. Yeah, it, really when you start talking about these veteran quarterbacks like Bo, right, and the mindset that he has, he's going to look at, like I had mentioned, that the one big miss to Tim White, that was a touchdown, right? Those two interceptions that he threw. And he's just going to download that into his head and be like, you know what, I'm not going to make this mistake again, right? So what I'm looking for Bo to do is he's still going to take those shots, and we saw Tommy dialed it up for him. I think he's going to maybe focus a little bit more, and he probably had already at practice at dropping those things in there, maybe not overthrowing Tim, giving him a chance, or some of those deep balls giving him a chance. But really what I look for him to do is just kind of be Bo, right? Like exactly what you saw in Winnipeg, it's just got to be executed a little bit better, right? And that's all it is in this game is is just dialing up those plays, reading out what you're normally used to reading out when the, that's in training camp this year or when he had played – you know, five years ago, six years ago, seven years ago, being able to read those out and just execute. And that just comes with time and experience and a new offense and just also getting your, your feet back under you in a new season. So a little bit more execution. I think he's going to probably be a little more dialed in this this week, right? Maybe take it. I'm not saying he didn't take it serious enough, but you know how it is as a pro court. If you put something on film that you are not happy with, Right, mm. You sit on that. You don't just sit on it and practice the next week where you're like, oh, man, I really wish I would have made that pass. And then you go home and everything's forgotten about. No, no, no. You mm. sit on that the moment you wake up, the moment you get to practice, the moment after practice, before you're going to bed. And I bet you dream of it every once in a while throughout that week, right? Like it sits on you. So I know Bo feels that same way, and that's going to be sitting with him, and I expect – I expect him to come out and just execute a little bit better. Yeah, totally. He's a pro. He's been here before, and I'm sure that he'll show everybody exactly uh, what a pro does to respond to a game like that. And, I mean, if if throwing for 200 and a touchdown is, is a bad game, then, you know, <laughs> it's going to be exciting when he connects on three or four of those deep balls because ah, I'll leave your imagination to see where that goes. But – uh, one other huge change, and as somebody who typically scores a lot of points, somebody who's super clutch, Seth Small, he has been moved to the suspended list, and they brought in the old Winnipeg kicker, Legio, which is a phenomenal name for a kicker. <laughs> uh, so does that change anything in how the coach would approach the game? Or I know he's a guy who's been in the league. He's made big kicks. Uh, he was somewhere in like the 73% range last year when he's kicking. Does that change anything for the game plan? Does a kicker, I think we talked about the kicker not even really needing to be in training camp at all. It's all the same. It's really just timing and rhythm. But being a late addition mentally as a coach, do you take anything special into consideration when you're going for an extra point or deciding where you're going to kick your field goals from? I, I think the only thing that you really take into consideration there is you just figure out the difference. Because Seth Small will have a certain range that he's good. Big leg. Yeah, and like he'll so he'll have a range, and they know this each game, right? They walk out there, they do the old test the wind, throw the grass in the air, figure out how much wind. They do about a hundred warm up kicks, and then they go over to Jeff Reinbold after and go, "Hey, going this way, I'm good from 47. Going this way, Ooh. I'm good from 53." Right, so that's what they'll right. say, and that's the only thing I think will change. Once you start talking right. about these professional kickers, I think you just kind of say, "Okay, where are you good from?" All right, well, if we want to take a shot at a field goal, you say you're good from there. We expect you to make it, and that's why they're professional kickers. 
just to be clear too, that suspended list that can mean a whole bunch of different things. Seth Small isn't in the isn't in the principal's office or anything <laughs> like that. It could mean a whole bunch of things. So I think Seth's gonna be okay, but he's working out some stuff, whatever it might be. But to bring Mark Leggio in, somebody that has been a professional kicker in this league, I think they just figure out his range and they'll they would have seen that at practice and they roll into the game saying, Okay, we're good from forty seven and it's just a number from for Jeff Ryan. Born to be a kicker. I hope he's good from further than 47 because our, <laughs> our boy Seth Small was knocking them back from 55, 56, 57, 58. But that's not what we're going to see today. So, hey, Leggy, I got all the faith in the world in you, baby. Let's let's see that big boot. <laughs> let's see it. Well, hopefully they're just extra points, you know, because uh, I want to see all those folks we were just talking about on the offense getting into the end zone that – tricky tricky end zone at BMO field that is partially grass and partially turf but that is something we've spoken about ad nauseum in the past and and I won't get on the Argos head until we we beat him after this one so heading into BMO field driving down that uh, lakeshore what are you visualizing as a fan who are you looking at the program and trying to get get a keen eye on What's the matchup or the player that you're going to isolate? Who's in the binoculars tonight? Yeah, what I'm looking for is is Tim White to have a breakout game. What I think what I think will be a good thing for the Ticats to have is a Tim White breakout game that we all know Tim White is capable of doing. And I think it's a perfect storm for Tim because the Argos, they don't have Jamal Peters out there. Right, and if anybody remembers Jamal Peters, it's the Tie Cat fans, because he got five picks against the Tie Cats last season. Right, Tie Cats sent him to the NFL. (laughs) Yeah, made him an All Star. So he's not out there. So what that means is Argos are rolling out with two new guys on that boundary side, where Tim White does most of his work. I'm expecting Tim White to have a big game. That's the matchup I'm looking for: is Tim White against the new Argos DBs on that boundary side. I want to see Tim have a big game, which in turn then gets Bo into that rhythm. Now he has Duke Williams, Keandre Smith, Tim White, and the rest of the crew. He's feeling confident. That's the first thing I'm going to look for is, is Tim White ready for this breakout game? How about yourself, yeah, Clark? What are you looking for? And, I mean, Tim White is going to be going up against Robertson Daniel, who's a boundary halfback there. He is a guy who's been a – big time under the radar since his rookie season in Calgary. I played with him in 2019. He's a heady guy. He plays with a lot of energy, great blitzer, and I think that it will be a good matchup. So that's a a good call there. I'll take Tim for 150. Uh, (laughs) For me, though, I'm watching. I'm really watching to see what's going to happen in this return game because Special teams has been such a large part of how this Ticats team generates a spark, gets on the scoreboard, gets set up in field goal range. You know, Lawrence Woods brought the ball over midfield a couple of times last week. He had a 40 yard return average on kickoff. I believe it was it was really a clinic on just moving the ball. Drive star average was awesome. And that helps a lot. So. Um, whether it's getting over 10 yards per punt return and setting your offense up and, and moving the flipping the field, so to speak, when possessions flip back and forth, or if it's actually getting all the way into scoring range, I think that, you know, the Andre Gallimore is going to have a great opportunity to have a humongous impact in this game. Even if he only gets a handful of snaps on offense, those seven, eight, nine, ten 10 punt returns those will be crucial in determining what kind of scenarios are we seeing in this game. Are we seeing the Ticats backed up coming out of the shadow of their own goalposts? Or are we seeing them starting around midfield already testing Legio's 47-yard <laughs> range? You know, So I'm interested to see uh, what happens in that special teams game with Lawrence Wood III not in. And, you know, what more can we ask for? We've got... Tons of storylines. Yeah, and when you look at, like in court, even just to add on that, when you look at some of those penalties, right, when those are in the return game, we talk about this all the time, right? We talk about this all the time. When those penalties are in that return game, that is the difference between the Ticats offense playing on an arena-sized field 
and being able to only have to go 50 yards to score or being backed up shadow of that goal post like you talked about 20 yards close to their own end zone and have to go the long way in that's the biggest difference so having those tie cats like we said that's going to be point one two three four five in that locker room is no more penalties i think that gives galmore a good little look at maybe bringing that thing into the end zone or helping that tie cats offense out yeah, there will be no shortage of motivation or big plays tonight. 7 p.m. kickoff at BMO Field. The Argos home opener. The Ticats coming to spoil it. And you can catch all that action at listen.ticats.ca. And every single week, myself, Mike Daly, we will be giving you that pregame pregame where you can get ready to see all to know all the people you're going to see at the game so make sure you check us out on spotify if you're watching on youtube and check us out on youtube if you're listening on a podcast and until next week we hope you have a great game day peace it's game day and you're ready so are we let us know your thoughts email us at game day at tycats.ca courtney steven and mike daly are here every game day with their insights into today's game subscribe to the tycats audio network on spotify or wherever you get your podcasts